How's it going everyone, Taki here. We have another Retroid Pocket 4 video for you today. This is going to be a deep dive into the emulation performance in the new Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. Now this video is gonna be predominantly about emulation, but there are some important points that I didn't get to talk about in my last video that we're gonna talk about in here. And we also have some updates on some issues that I brought up in my first look that we'll also address in this video. As a quick recap, the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro comes with the Dimensity 1100 processor, and I had a few questions on this topic. In my first look video, I said this is an eight core processor in a 431 configuration with three of the A78 cores clocked at 2.4 gigahertz. If we go by Retroid spec page, they list that all of the A78 cores should go to 2.6 gigahertz, and we can see the same thing on MTK's website. I don't know if this is a software issue or if this is a poorly bin processor that can't reach all of the max clocks at the same time, but the highest performance profile that we can use on the RP4 Pro will not allow us to lock all of the A78 cores to 2.6 gigahertz. We are left with three running at 2.4 gigahertz and a final one running at the rated 2.6 gigahertz. It's kind of strange and I've never seen anything like this before, but we need to use that high performance profile for most of what this can do on the high end, so we're stuck with a 431 configuration with slower clock speeds. I hope that clarifies things. In this video, we only have the RP4 Pro, but a lot of people are wondering how this compares to the cheaper RP4 model with the Dimensity 900. I don't have that model, but I do have another device with that chip that we can look at for this section of the video. It probably won't be obvious to you because this is not a color that was officially sold, but this is the Odin Light, and it comes with the same processor that comes in the RP4 base model. The biggest difference being that this was a $199 that was discounted to around $179 if I'm not mistaken, whereas the RP4 or base version comes in at $150. Now the gaming experience is completely different between the two of these and the processor cost has come down since this originally came out, but this was a very good deal before this hardware came out. And the only real competition that it's had from a price versus performance standpoint was probably the Pimax Portal Retro Edition when it went on sale at $199. But anyway, we're gonna do some benchmarks on both of these and we're gonna talk about some of the performance differences that we can expect to see or we would expect to see between the Dimensity 1100 and the Dimensity 900 when it comes to emulation. To get a better idea of what's going on here, let's take a look at some benchmarks between both of these chips before switching over to some real world performance tests because this won't tell you the full story. First up, we have a CPU benchmark and you'll see that there is a big difference between the single core scores and the multi-core scores. The difference between the multi-core score is easy to explain because this chip has more performance cores than this one does. This one has two performance cores and six efficiency cores, but this has four and four. But if we look over at the single core performance, we can see that that's 1126 on the D1100 versus around 900 on the D900. That difference is largely due to the fact that this has a performance core that can clock up to 2.6 gigahertz, whereas this one can only go to 2.4. When it comes to emulation, we care more about the single core performance because a lot of the emulators that are out there can only run on one or two cores. So you you won't really see a big difference between both of these processors in CPU bound emulation. This one will have an easier time playing high end PS2 games, but this one won't be that far behind. But when we go over to the Vulkan score, there's a huge gap here. And if you just looked on the numbers here, you'd say, okay, I can spend 50 more dollars and get the D1100 and I'm getting more than double the GPU performance. And yeah, if you just go buy this, that's a good trade-off. For Vulcan, we're at 47.16 on the D1100 versus 21.89 on the D900. When it comes to OpenCL, we also have a huge gap here with 46.80 on the D1100 versus 20.61 on the D900. The problem is, this doesn't take into account a lot of the specific things that are required for emulation. This score doesn't tell you anything about the compatibility of the GPU you have and whether or not it has the things that are required from the emulators that you want to run, but more importantly, it doesn't scale like this when you're actually emulating something. Where you will see this performance gap the most is when you are going to increase the rendering resolution. But if you're capping both of these at 720p or 1080p, then it won't be that easy to notice a difference. All right, so now let's look at some real world performance differences between both of these processors. And just keep in mind, this is a $199 device and this is a $199 device, but the hardware that's here is sold as an RP4 model for $150. Let's start with the God of War games for PlayStation 2 since those are a decent CPU benchmark. I have the same save state on both these devices so we can get an easy apples to apples comparison. On the top, we have the RP4 Pro using the high performance profile. If we swipe down from here, you can see that it's on high performance. 
I have the brightness set to max and we're using the smart fan. And on the Odin light, if we swipe down from there, you can see that it's on high performance, max brightness and the smart fan. And at max brightness, the brightness level between both of these is about the same. So that shouldn't be a big difference. But let's take a look at what we have here. First on the top, you can see that we do in fact have a 4, 3, 1 configuration. You can see that CPU 7 is the only one that goes to 2.6 gigahertz. We don't really need maxed out clocks for something like this, but this is the best way that we can get an apples to apples comparison. Now everything is equal and we can see a couple of interesting things here. First, if you take a look at the power consumption, there are times when the RP4 Pro can get really high up in the power consumption where this current right here will get close to 2000. For example, right there was 2.2 amps, which is a lot of power to use on this chip. But the D900 and the Odin Lite also can get pretty high. Right here it's at 1.7 amps or 1.8 amps. It fluctuates a bit, but it does use a lot of power for something that's this demanding. I'll also point out that we're not using any underclocking settings on either one of these. This is just purely 0, zero for this benchmark that we're trying to do. But as you can see, it's running on the bottom device with no problem problems in this situation. This is not going to be universal across the entire game, but in this area right here, it's fine. And obviously the same thing can be said for the RP4 Pro. Now let's increase the resolution to 2x native to see what that does with these two chips and see if we can then find where the gap lies. Now we're at 2x native on both of these. That bump in resolution is a lot more apparent on the Odin Lite than it is on the RP4 Pro, but both of them still look good. You'll see now on the Odin Light that we are not hitting a solid 60 FPS in this setting right here. It will dip a bit below and the fans are also increasing because now we have a higher load, especially on the GPU. On the RP4 Pro, we're at a solid 60 FPS in this area running the same track. So you can obviously see that there is more performance to be had with this processor, obviously because we do have that higher clock, but we have more performance cores. Now here's where things get interesting. So this is a 0, zero versus a 0, zero comparison where we're not using any underclock settings, but we could use underclock settings on the D900 to get about the same experience that we're getting on the RP4 Pro. We can set the EE cycle rate to minus one and the EE cycle skip rate to two, and that should give us about the same experience that we can get on the RP4 Pro. If you go by this OSD reading on the top here, you can see that we're no longer hitting a max of 60 FPS. There are times when it'll go under, but that is 100% of the speed that's needed for this underclock setting. And the game is fully playable, it's just not as smooth as it is on the RP4 Pro with a 0-0 setting. Let's check another game. For this, we have God of War 2, and you'll see that we don't have that EE cycle skip rate turned on right now, but we are not able to run this game at 60 FPS with these settings on the D900. We're only running at 42 FPS, and it is much slower than it is on the D1100. The D1100 is not having any problems here, but it is using a ton of power. You may have just seen that it went up to 3 amps, which is an insane amount of power to use on a device that is this small. The D900 in the Odin Lite cannot run this game with a 0-0 setting, but it also does not use anywhere near as much power as the RP4 Pro does. And if we just go into those system settings and set this back to minus one plus two, yeah, we can play this game. It's just not as smooth as it is on the RP4 Pro. So it's not like you're going from completely unplayable to playable with a $50 increase in price. You're just able to play a game that is demanding like this without having to use any of these settings that will lower your FPS target while still running at 100% but you're also using way more power to do so. For our next test, we have a GameCube game. This is Metroid Prime 2. It's one of the most difficult GameCube games to run, and it needs a lot of CPU power to run well. With the official Dolphin emulator and the same settings on both of these, we can run the game at 60 FPS on both of these in the area that I'm in, and the experience is about the same on both of them, but you will see there are some times when the FPS will go a bit under 60 on the RP4 Pro. The same thing will happen on the Odin Lite, but it goes down a bit further. If you wanted to run this game on the D900, you'd probably be better off with something like MMJR1 or MMJR2. That would get you better performance in this, but you do have to work around some annoying hacks. In terms of power consumption, both of these are pretty close together. And our final game for this comparison is a Wii title. This is Super Mario Galaxy 2. It's another very demanding game, but for the Wii system, and you can see that it's running on both of these, but the FPS is higher on the RP4 Pro. So again, this is a situation where the game can run on both devices, but for the D900, if you want to play it at 2x native resolution, then you'd be better off using the MMJR or the MMJR2 build. We talked briefly about power consumption in that last section, and I also talked about it in my first look, but let's talk about it on the extreme end, and and what is going into that power consumption. And if you look down over here on the left side, you can see our wattage. Now this total package here can use at most 
around 12 watts of power, which is really nuts for something that's this small. There are a few things that are going into this, both on the software side and on the hardware side. On the software side, we have that fan and we can see how much that impacts us by just going over to a static screen. So let's go over to ADA64. All right, here we are in ADA64. I have this on the high performance mode with the smart fan. Let's just put this on turbo or sports mode. And you can see when we're idling with the clocks all maxed out with nothing running, we're using around four watts of power, which is a lot to use. If we just go to this discharge rate here and we can see that we're idling at just under one amp, which is a lot of power to use for something like this. But let's further isolate this. Let's now go over to the standard setting. We're gonna set that on standard and then we're gonna turn the fan on and we're gonna turn the fan on sport so it's using the most power for the fan with the lowest CPU and GPU profile. And you can see that there's not a lot that's changed here. The CPU clocks are still spinning up a bit higher than they would normally need to be in a situation like this, but we are still using around one amp of power. And this is with the fan on max. Let's see what happens when we turn the fan off completely and everything else stays the same. So we just disable the fan. We're now using about half the power that we were before. We're idling at two watts, which is way better than four watts. So based on this, we know that the fan is adding about two watts of total power to this system when you're on the high end, emulating very demanding things that need the fan running at full speed. So that's one thing, and there's not a whole lot that we can do when we're using that high performance profile where we need to use the fan on the max setting or the smart setting, because the CPU temps can get pretty high in this enclosure. But there are situations where the fan speed is ramping up too high when it doesn't need to be, and in those cases, we're probably using about one watt of additional power just to have the fan spinning up more than it needs to be. The next hardware thing that we have to deal with is the screen. This screen uses a ton of power. If we have this thing running at max brightness like it is right now, that is going to add a lot to our power consumption. For example, if I change the brightness to the minimum setting, which is more than you'll need if you wanna play this at night in bed, we're using one watt of power. And if you're gonna be playing something that doesn't require a lot of power, then your battery life is gonna go a lot further. The final thing is both software and hardware. On the hardware side, this CPU can use a ton of power when you push it all the way. You do get something for that power, but I don't think the juice is worth the squeeze. On the software side, the CPU and GPU profiles that we have on this are not really tuned adequately for this kind of solution. In this section, we're gonna talk more about the screen on the RP4 and the RP4 Pro. Now, I read a lot of comments from people about that footage. Some people that just had like normal thoughts about the screen looking bad and how they hoped that the company would come in and fix it. And then there was a separate group inside that group that was angry that I was even talking about this situation to begin with, or that they were angry that I didn't talk about that the company was going to fix it, which was something that was being talked about at that time. If a problem exists and it exists while I'm reviewing it, then that's what I report on. I don't do wishful thinking stuff that's probably going to be fixed because a lot of people can have different definitions of what a fix would be. So what I did is I just said, here's the problem and here's how it will be fixed and here are the potential consequences of the fix. Typically when I'm doing a review video for something like this, I don't really have much conversation with a company that's making the device unless I run into a problem that I think is significant enough to bring to their attention. The green screen issue is an example of that, but this also extends to other products. If I'm not mistaken, I believe there was like an RG351 series device that had like a D-pad issue that was not registering inputs correctly, or there was another one that that had Wi-Fi interference with the onboard Wi-Fi and the speakers, so they just like removed it before release. Then there's the whole RG552 issue with the audio delay that, that didn't end up getting fixed before they pushed the release of that device. But some more recent examples would be the touchscreen issue in the Win 600 or the line issue that I pointed out in my RG35XX Plus video. I pass on these kinds of issues to the manufacturer if the device is a review unit or if I bought it with my own money, if I think the issue is significant enough. So while I was working on my RP4 first look video, there were a lot of other people that were doing first impressions looks on it and a lot of them pointed out that their screens were green when that feedback got sent back to the company they thought that that problem was due to the wallpaper and how android just colors the ui elements based on the colors that are in the wallpaper which is a fair assessment to make because that is something that happens and that's why i pointed it out in my first look video while that was going on i was filming the last part of my first look video at the beginning because the green screen was so shocking and i wanted to pass that information on to the company what i was trying to do is to show them that it was a hardware issue with the footage that i had and this essentially just looked like showing them some clips from that last section of the video that I made while I was filming 
filming it to give them a full overview of what was happening. Let's go over some of the ways that this issue could have been caused, both from the software side and the hardware side, before we ultimately get to the point where we know that it's a hardware problem and that it's not something that you need to be, like, so worried about. So from the software side, there's really only two ways that this issue could have been caused, and one of them I already detailed with the wallpaper. If we change the wallpaper to white and the screen is still green and all the UI elements are still green, then there must be another reason for that to be the case. And that leaves you with your second option, which is that the screen is misconfigured. And a lot of the messaging around this time was that there was some saturation issue that needed to be fixed or the screen wasn't properly configured, which is not technically correct. But if we just accept that last point as true, that the screen is just misconfigured, then we can find out that that is not the case by just doing a simple test. And just so we're on the same page, when we're talking about a screen being configured incorrectly from an Android standpoint, we're talking about something like this, where the user has full control over this like menu here that they can customize the color temperature to be whatever they want. So for example, I could make the screen have a pink tint to it, or I could make it blue if I really wanted to ruin the screen, but that's what we mean. We don't have this kind of UI on Retroid, but it is possible that this UI does exist hidden and it was configured wrong. If you're in a situation where you have hardware that was configured incorrectly in software, then you can usually find out if that's the case by looking at how the screen looks before Android is fully booted. The good thing for us is we have a boot screen on all of these devices that has a logo in the middle and we can use that to judge the white balance of the screen. So what I did for the RP4 Pro was boot up the device and then look at the boot screen before the Android system is fully initialized and I saw that that was green. And the only way that that would be green is if the screen was actually native green by hardware. So this is what I mean. Right now, Android has not started up yet. It is in the process of booting up. So right now, what you are seeing is how the screen is configured by default from a hardware level. And this logo here is white. It was just green there, but you get the point. So after I had that, I went on to film the rest of the video because I knew basically there was only two ways that they could fix that issue. They can either buy a new screen that doesn't have the same LED backlight that's green, or they can try to fix it in software. Replacing it outright is not realistic for any company of this size. So the only option is really for software, and I knew that that would turn out in the same way that the Win 4 turned out because it works in the same way. So I finished my first look video by showing what would likely happen to this screen once it's properly configured in software to correct the hardware problem. So let's boot up the device now. And the first thing that you'll notice is this screen is still green because right now Android hasn't started up, but you will see when Android starts to start up that this will change because the software fix is being applied. It's very obvious. See, it just changed. That is the software fix. And if we change the wallpaper to white, you can see that that screen is not green at all anymore. But I hope that gives you some better insight to how I approach reviews and like where I feel my obligation is to bring stuff to the attention of a manufacturer before I publish a video here on YouTube. I never want a company to be like completely blindsided. I wanna give them as much of a heads up as possible. In this case, we had a hardware problem that can be fixed easily with software. I think there's an over-reliance to just say things are software problems when they're really not software issues. This is an issue that can be fixed with software, but it is hardware in nature. This would never happen if the backlight LEDs were not green like they were before this fix was applied. There are some important implications for the software fix that they applied here for the lifetime of this device that I think the company would be better off just like being open about. I don't feel like it's my place to describe any of that. And for some people that were like really making fun of the company about how this happened to begin with, I will just say stuff like this can easily happen if you're a small company. For many years, it was part of my job to worry about small details like this. And it still is a large part of the real job that I do outside of just making YouTube videos as a hobby. Even when you have the best intentions to worry about something like this and keep an eye on it, you can still get screwed by your supplier. And that's if you care about consistency. I could take out nine Miu Minis right now from my studio and they all have completely different screens and completely different screen characteristics. Now, if you wanna know how this looks for yourself and you have an RP3, then you'll pretty much know what to expect. This is the RP3 screen that replaced the blue one that I don't think a lot of people have from the total lifespan of this device. This new screen with the configuration looks similar to this, but it has a bit more of a magenta tint, especially on the left half of the screen when you're looking at a pure white background. There's also some magenta fringing in some situations, but largely this is way better than the first screen was. Anyway, here's the benchmark data. We'll start off first with how it was before it was configured. And remember, I pointed out three things that could probably be impacted by a software solution. These three things would be the color gamut, the maximum brightness, 
and the contrast ratio. For our new software fix for this screen, we don't have an impact on our color gamut. It's still basically the same, but our maximum brightness did take a hit from the 700s down to the 500s. When it comes to the contrast ratio, that took a noticeable hit, but you will only notice that in darker games. In regular settings, it's not that obvious. We've covered a ton of stuff in the first few sections of this video, but we have a lot more. It's finally time to do a deep dive into what this can do from an emulation standpoint. You are probably looking at the timeline right now, wondering how we still have more than 30 minutes of footage left in this video. And that's for good reason. There are over 140 games in this emulation section. I think this is the most coverage that I've ever done for a handheld, and I hope this answers any questions that you may have about what this can do. We'll start with the fifth generation of consoles with Sega Saturn. Everything before this can run with no problems on this chip, and quite frankly, there's no real reason to buy this model if you care more about things that are older than Sega Saturn. I will point out that I'm using the high performance profile for all of this footage. That isn't because we necessarily need it for every system, but it will eliminate any performance issues that we would have from the operating system. Now, even though Sega Saturn is very old, it still requires a decent processor to run well. With the RP4 Pro, we can use the Beetle Saturn Core and RA to run just about anything with ease. There are other emulators for Saturn that have some more options than this, but this one is free without ads and it is plug and play. Next up from here, we have PlayStation 1. For this, I'm using the Duck Station standalone emulator, and I have the rendering resolution set to just about max out the panel, with PGXP turned on to fix some of the 3D scenes. This one is a smaller section, but this is Nintendo 64 with the Mupin 64 Plus Core in RA. I have the rendering resolution set to 720p, and I'm using the wide adjusted setting to get a 16x9 image. In this section, we have Dreamcast with the Flycast Core in RA. Just like Nintendo 64, we have the rendering resolution set to 720p, and we're using widescreen hacks to get a 16x9 image for compatible games. holographic assistant. Let's begin by stepping into your suit. Like most of what we just covered, PSP is a system that ran just fine on the RP3+. For this, we're using the PPSSPP standalone emulator, and I have the rendering resolution set to 3x native. I showed off some Vita footage in my first look, and I wanted to include some more in this video. The Vita 3K emulator is still getting a lot of updates, with the most recent one dropping in the last week. Even though some games run well on this, there are a lot of graphical issues in games that run much better on Snapdragon processors. Coming from around here, it's faint. It still doesn't feel very good. Well, I might as well get some training in while I search the area.
Well, welcome to Inaba. I'm Ryotaro Dojima. I'll be looking after you. Let's see, I'm your mother's younger brother, and that about sums it up. Did you... did you hear that awful cry? We have five systems left for this video, and the first four have a ton of games in each one of them. The first one is 3DS with the Citra emulator. I have the rendering resolution set to 2x native by default for all of these titles, and only change it to 1x if the game does not run well at 2x. If going to 1x doesn't change anything at all, I will only have footage for the game running at 2x native. signs of life, but I feel like something's here. Ah! <laughs> 
Our next big system is GameCube, and for this, I decided to use only the official Dolphin emulator. I have the rendering resolution set to 2x native. If a game doesn't run well at 2x, I'll drop the rendering resolution and try again. For almost all of these titles, I use the Vulkan backend, but there are a few titles like Mario Kart Double Dash that need OpenGL to work. I'll use that last explosive here. You're dead! Ha! Take this! for those walkers. Do something about those cannons. We'll go for the cannons.
Now it's time to test some Wii emulation on this. I made sure to include a few heavy titles for this video, but this handheld was able to chew through most of what I threw at it with no issues. Both corners still have a chance to win this. What kind of developments can we expect to see next? Slam them! Taken down by an intense blow! will be late. All I know is what they tell me. Security has been tightened. Nobody gets through. Great. Why not take the food out of my mouth? Maybe my damn feelings while you're at it. Even. Target's down. Area clear. I'm moving to the truck. Moving to your location.
I believe this is the biggest section in this entire video. This is going to be an extensive look at PS2 performance on the RP4 Pro. If you saw my first look, you may remember I talked about putting together a systematic way to classify PS2 performance in handhelds. That work is still ongoing, and it has now transformed into what will be a cross-platform benchmark that I'll be able to use to test out all of the PS2-capable handhelds that come out. It's not ready yet, but I made sure to include a lot of heavy PS2 games in this section, as well as some viewer suggestions. Obviously, this processor cannot run the entire PS2 library, but that isn't only because this is a mobile chip or that this has a Mali GPU. There are actually some games in this section that run way better on weaker Mali GPUs that are newer, like the one in the RK358, if you can believe it. Still, this thing holds up very well, but battery life is going to take a dive on heavier titles that need all of the power that we have. We're standing by to occupy your positions. Another obstacle. They must be planning to kill it then.
Flies are always in red boxes. Dragovic, Garic, Baumgartlinger. Welcome to the Gadgetron Hotels. We are here to offer you advice during your interest on the travels. The help desk is a free service provided by the Press circle to fire your shock blaster.
Switch is the last system for this video, but the vast majority of titles for this system will not run well or at all on this handheld. So my advice is to just think of this as a bonus. Even when a game looks like it's running fine, it can still crash, which probably isn't worth the hassle in the long run. Now occasionally I get questions on input lag in handhelds, and I have an entire video covering this topic with an older Retroid Pocket model. I only ever comment on input lag if it falls outside of a normal range. When I do experience excessive input lag, it is usually a combination of a game running at a very low native FPS or an issue with the emulator. Out of all the titles that I tested in this video, Hollow Knight for the Yuzu emulator was the only one that had very high input lag. This is strange because the game shows that it's running at 60 FPS, but this is not how this game feels natively on a PC, on the Switch, or on other handhelds using the Yuzu emulator. It's a bit strange, but I wanted to leave this comment to sum up my experience with input lag across all of the titles that I filmed for this video. That's about all I have for this deep dive video. If you found this helpful at all, consider subscribing to the channel. There are no affiliate links tied to this video for the RP4 Pro, so if you want to support work like this, subscribing is the best way. As you can imagine with all of the games that we tested in this video, this was a ton of work to put together. I hope it helps. Happy gaming everyone, Taki out.